checked in the hotel president in Kansas City at 1.20 p.m. in room 1046 on Wednesday, January 2, 1935, witnesses said that he looked around 20 to 35 years old. He had brown hair, a scar on his scalp visible above his ear, and a cauliflower ear. He was dressed in a black coat when the bellboy, Randolph Probst, helped Owen to his room. Probst reported that Owen packed only a toothbrush, comb, and toothpaste. The hotel maid, Mary Soptik, recalled that Owen's room was dimly lit. In a police interrogation, Mary reported, he was either worried about something or afraid. Dena Siopa, at 4 p.m., Soptik returned to Owen's room with fresh towels. She saw Owen sitting calmly on his bed in a full suit in dim lights with the door unlocked. She also saw a notepad that read, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait. Dena Siopa, dot, the next day, January 3rd, Soptik came to clean the room at 10.30 a.m. She observed that the door was locked from the outside and assumed that Owen was not in the room. However, Owen was sitting inside the room with the lights off. Soptik thought someone had locked the door from outside. Owen received a call to which he replied, No, Don, I don't want to eat. I am not hungry. I just had breakfast. Dena Siopa. Owen repeated himself, saying, No. I am not hungry, Soptik came back at 4 p.m. to deliver fresh towels. She heard two male voices from the room. She knocked on the room and heard a manly voice from inside. The man inquired who was at the door. She said that she came to deliver towels upon which the man sent her away. The situation got creepier on January 4. The hotel phone operator noticed at 7 o'clock a.m. that Owen's phone had been off the hook, he sent Probst, the bellboy, to fix his phone. Probst knocked at his door, but Owen never opened the door. At 8.30 a.m., the hotel management sent another bellboy named Harold Pike into his room, he used the hotel pass key to enter Owen's room. Pike noticed that Owen was lying naked on his bed, seemingly drunk and the bedding beneath him was dark in color. The bellboy fixed the phone and came back. At 10.30 a.m., Owen's phone was found again disconnected from the hook. Probst went to fix the problem when he found himself in utter horror. He opened the door and saw Owen kneeling on the floor, there was blood everywhere in the room. The walls, ceiling, bathe, beddings all were covered in splashes of blood. Randolph freaked out and left the room immediately, Owen was discovered covered in gruesome injuries, in his room. A cord had been tightly tied around his neck, wrists, and ankles. It seemed like he had been tortured and strangled. He had been hit repeatedly on his head. His skull was fractured. He was knifed several times in the chest, which punctured his lungs. He had bruises on his neck as a result of strangulation, surprisingly, he was still alive. One of the detectives arrived early on the scene asked Owen who did this to him. Upon which he replied that he was alone in his room and he fell against the bathtub. After a brief dialogue exchange, Owen fainted. He was then taken to the hospital. On January 5, Owen died from the lethal injuries leaving behind a long list of questions regarding the case. According to a doctor, the injuries on Owen's body occurred six to seven hours before Owen's death. The autopsy result concluded that the murderer was torturing Owen when his phone was constantly being disconnected from the hook, the officers scrutinized Owen's room to collect proofs regarding his supposed suicide. As he claimed that nobody came into his room, however, they did not find a weapon that could be used in suicide. Therefore, the suicide theory was ruled out. Shockingly, female fingerprints were found on the telephone in Owen's room. This hint opened the door to multiple new theories. As the case progressed, police found that Roland Owen was faking his name. Owen had told hotel management that he belonged to Los Angeles. However, the Los Angeles authorities denied any records of Roland T. Owen. 
Many people called the police to check if Owen was someone they lost. In 1936, a woman named Ruby Ogletree identified Owen as her son and told the police that he was Artemis Ogletree and not Roland T. Owen. Artemis had sent Ruby three letters before his death. Ruby claimed that the letters did not seem familiar with Artemis's writing tone. The police also found that Mrs. Ogletree stayed in Kansas City during the murder of her child, which further tangled the case. Soon after Artemis's death, the burial authorities received a random call. A man insisted that they bury Artemis in the Memorial Park Cemetery, he promised to cover all expenses of Artemis's funeral. On March 23, 1935, an anonymous sender delivered flowers and money wrapped in newspaper to the funeral home. A card accompanied the flowers and money which read, Love Forever, Louise. The investigators deduced a theory that the person named Don had a conflict with Artemis. He killed Artemis and ran away with it. The police also believed that Mrs. Ogletree and Don lived briefly in Kansas City together when Artemis was killed, the second theory resulted from the hotel's elevator operator, Charles Bloker's interrogation. Bloker claimed that he saw a young woman looking for room number 1026, however, she seemed confused, and she might have mixed room 1026 with room 1046. Bloker also said that he saw the lady with a man later, which could have been Don, female fingerprints were found in Artemis's room. The young lady and Don might have killed Artemis and left the hotel, the third theory had been the most popular among people. Investigators believed that Artemis had been cheating on his fiancée, and in a fit of rage, his fiancée ended up killing him with the help of her brother, the anonymous person who was ready to fund Artemis's funeral requested the burial authorities to bury Artemis in the Memorial Park Cemetery as it would be near his sister's home. The police linked this man with Artemis's mysterious murder, Artemis Ogletree's murder remains a mystery to this date. There was not enough proof to convict anyone. However, many people believe that Ogletree's murder was a result of his infidelity in his relationship.